when you're with someone, you have to be really vulnerable to admit that you are needing something. You have to be really raw and really sort of almost like take some skin off to say, look, I'm struggling with this and I need you. I need the this, this support with this. And plucking up the courage again to ask for help like that can be really difficult, especially for people who have a fear of failure, fear of being judged, fear of being criticized, or their own inner critical voice says, you're not allowed to do that because you don't deserve it. So we can get really blocked in receiving or asking for compassion to flow in. That was Michaela Thomas on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and co-author of Act Daily Journal. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the upcoming book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Psychologists Off the Clock is proud to be partnered with Praxis Continuing Education. Praxis is the premier provider of evidence-based training for mental health professionals. And here at Psychologists Off the Clock, we are huge fans of Praxis. One of the things I love most about Praxis is they offer both live and on-demand courses. So if you're really looking for that live interaction with other people who are taking the course, you can get that. Or if you have a busy schedule and you need something that you can just kind of click onto whenever you have time, they offer that as well. And every course I have ever taken from Praxis has really been of such value to me. I get questions a lot from clinicians who are looking for ACT training or other types of trainings. And Praxis is my go-to place that I send people no matter what level they are because they have really good beginner trainings for people who have no experience. And they also have terrific advanced trainings on different topics and just people who want to keep building their skills. You can go to our website and get a coupon for the live trainings by going to our offers page at offtheclockpsych.com slash sponsors. And we'll hope to see you there. I'm here with Yael to introduce today's episode with Michaela Thomas. And Michaela has a really interesting approach to treating couples where she combines elements of compassion-focused therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and behavioral couples therapy. And one of the things that I was thinking about was the role of language and ACT. And how one of the things that creates psychological inflexibility is when we get caught up in some of the stuff in our minds, assumptions, rules, predictions, the stories that we tell ourselves. And one of the elements of CFT, which is really kind of like the main topic of Michaela's book, is looking at the role of compassion with couples. And part of CFT or part of of compassion is mindfulness and awareness of thoughts and feelings. And how important it is to show up to communication with your partner in a way that allows you to really deeply listen, not just coming in hot with whatever message it is that you want to send, but making a choice to show up and be able to listen. And Yael, I know that you had some thoughts about this as well. Yeah. Well, so in the couples therapy room, exactly what you're talking about is something that, you know, I see all the time where in a conversation that is one of those repeat conversations, couples are just kind of stuck in some content. It's often the case that both people are feel as if they already know how their partner is going to respond. They already understand perfectly what it is that's important to their partner. And what I usually counsel people is to, to engage some curiosity, right? There might be some elements that they don't fully understand. Our partners are constantly going to surprise us, hopefully, right? Because people are ever evolving and it's more interesting to have somebody who surprises you. And invariably, people are able to learn something new when they slow down and are pushed to listen. That's in the couples therapy room. But I think what Michaela is so beautifully suggesting to people is that you can do this on your own, engage some curiosity about what it is that you don't yet know, ways that your story, holes that your story might have that you may assume 
are perfectly clear and totally consistent, but actually don't match up to the messier reality of relationships and and being human. So to enter into conversations with more of that curiosity rather than certainty of the stories, of the labels, of, of the predictions that you feel certain will happen gives you more room to learn more about your partner and connect to them. And and compassion is a big piece of that. Compassion for your partner to feel misunderstood, but also compassion for yourself. Like it, it is hard to listen deeply. Some of the content that your partner might be trying to share with you might be hard to hear. And so to bring some of that softness to yourself of how hard it is to hear, but also some willingness. Yeah, it, it kind of makes me think of the Buddhist concept of beginner's mind you know, we often come into these conversations with like all the baggage, like you said, if it's a repeat conversation, especially so all the baggage that's come before and trying to come, you know, sort of as if this is the first time that we're having this conversation. And, you know, part of the that language piece and the assumptions is sort of assuming, you know, someone's motivation. And one of the things she talks about that I like is digging a little bit deeper about like, what, what is your history that may have contributed to you being here in this place and how that can really help with compassion when you understand where this is really coming from and having a conversation around that. And that can even really, I think, be connecting. A hundred percent. One thing that you guys talk about, and I, I think this is such an important point and needs to be underscored like many times over, is that that is hard to do when you're coming in hot, when when you're sort of riled up about a topic that is, you know, that, that is frustrating to you, that you feel like your partner isn't understanding, that you feel totally right about and that they're totally wrong. And being mindful and curious in that moment can be really challenging. And so one of the things that I often think about harkens back to this research from a marital researcher by the name of Scott Stanley, who's got a number of terrific books. And one part of his research is about how cohabitation before engagement or marriage is more more strongly associated with relationship dissolution than having a long-term commitment. So he calls this sliding versus deciding into, into living together. But he applies this concept of sliding versus deciding in conflict with your partner. And what he talks about is that it's it's quite useful to be careful about how you have high conflict conversations. It's not that you should avoid them. There's clearly something that's bothering you that needs to be processed or worked out with your partner. But to be more deliberate about how you enter in can allow you to do some of these things that you and Michaela are talking about. Have that compassion and curiosity. Have that openness to listening. Be more careful about how you communicate what's important to you. And so really being deliberate about entering into those conversations sets you up to have a more productive conversation where you can both listen and speak more skillfully. Yeah, I think that that is such a great point and really goes along with what Michaela says when she talks about heat in relationships versus coolness in relationships and finding that happy medium in the middle, a warm glowing ember kind of state and that we can decide both to have a conversation during that glowing ember phase as well as go into it deciding to be a really good deep listener. So we hope you enjoy this episode with Michaela Thomas. Hey, everybody, it's Jill here, and I am delighted to introduce today's guest, Michaela Thomas, who is here to talk to us today about her book based on using compassion to help build a lasting connection for couples. Michaela Thomas is a clinical psychologist, couples therapist, and founder of the private practice, The Thomas Connection. Michaela specializes in perfectionism, helping high striving women let go of the pressure of perfection to find the balance to burn bright and not burn out. She has authored the book, The Lasting Connection, Develop Love and Compassion for Yourself and Your Partner. Michaela, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on Psychologists Off the Clock. Well, thank you, Jill. It's really, really uh, fun to be here and just finally get a chance to talk to you. I know we we have connected in multiple ways over the years, but this is the first time we've ever really sat face well face to face over Zoom, but you know, kind yeah. of in person. Congratulations on your book; it's terrific. And as far as I can tell, it seems to be the only couples book that really focuses on using compassion and elements of compassion focused therapy to help couples. Which you know, when I was reading it, I thought, "Gosh, this is so obvious!" And how did it not? exist before. It seems like a really important addition. Thank you. Yeah, I I believe so. When I did the market research, there wasn't anything that was 
specifically about that. There's a few things around so Zen Buddhism and there's a few really good books around acceptance and commitment therapy, which is obviously there's a lot of crossover between ACT and CFT. Uh, and I use both both modalities in the book, but I also combined it with behavioral couples therapy. So that's kind of my core training as a couples therapist is in behavioral couples therapy by, uh, by Don Borkham. And I just couldn't find anything that was combining all three methods and wrote yeah. for mass market rather than writing it as kind of an academic textbook. Right, right. And well, it's very juicy. There's a lot in here. So let's dig in. And as usual, I have way more questions than we could ever possibly <laughs> get through. But I thought one one place we could start, and this is right in the beginning of your book that I think is really important is, you know, one of the, the things you say is that love is not enough to building a lasting connection. And that we also have to have a caring commitment, clarity, and courage. So you can you talk a little bit more about what you mean in terms of those three elements that go kind of above and beyond? You know, of course, we all have love when we begin our connections. Mm. But what about these other three elements that help build that lasting connection? Well, the three things you mentioned about caring, commitment, clarity, and courage are sort of the, the, the three-legged stool that makes up compassion in the way that Paul Gilbert founded Compassion Focused Therapy in the UK. And I thought about those three legs to the stool, that unless you actually have all three of those in a committed, uh, intimate relationship, it's going to be really hard to be compassionate. It's going to be really hard to have a lasting connection. And we think about the care and commitment, that's kind of, it's not rocket science to figure out that it helps to care for each other. But the care and commitment doesn't just go outwards from you to your partner. It also goes inwards from you to yourself. Because if you don't have a caring commitment with yourself, you may end up being in relationships that are toxic or harmful to you. Or you might stay long beyond the expiry date in a relationship because you just don't give a damn about yourself. You don't care enough to be moved by your own suffering and then take action to alleviate that suffering, making yourself feel better. And the same goes for, for your partner. If you don't have that care and commitment towards them, they will feel very alone and lonely in that relationship with you. They will feel like you're being selfish or that they're not being looked after. So care and commitment is absolutely crucial to being compassionate with others and with yourself. And that sort of care and commitment, you can't have that if you don't notice, if you're not aware, if you don't have a mindful awareness of what's going on in yourself and in others. If you can't tune into your own needs, it's going to be really difficult to meet those needs. Um, so it starts with a kind of reality check of what's going on for you at the moment. Um, and that comes into sort of clarity as well, having the wisdom, the understanding, the clarity around what am I going through at the moment? What is my partner going through at the moment? What have each of us sort of faced on our journey before we even met each other? What's been the path we've been walking before we met each other? The kind of history of our relationships before this that will shape you. So clarity means that you get insight and understanding and wisdom to be able to choose wisely how you uh, act in your relationship, how you uh, prioritize your own needs and how you are compassionate with, with each other. And lastly, courage, as you can imagine, the things I've talked about so far can actually be really, really tricky. You know, tuning into your own needs and saying, I need this or I'm unfulfilled or your needs matter too, but I've got nothing left to give at the moment. I'm burnt out, for instance. It takes a lot of courage to ask for your needs to be met. It takes a lot of courage to set a boundary, for instance, to protect your needs. And it takes a lot of courage to sit with your partner when they're in distress, when they're upset, or when things aren't going well for them. So actually, to be able to be compassionate with yourself and others, we first have to sit with pain. And that takes tolerance, right. that takes acceptance, that takes courage. And the courage also to act on that insight, the clarity. When you realize what's hurt, hurting you or hurting your partner, it takes a lot of guts to actually do something about it. What yeah. am I going to do first? What steps will I take to be helpful rather than harmful towards myself and my partner? Right. And I think too, something you're, you're talking about here is the ability to engage in perspective taking at a time when it may not be particularly easy, you know, like when the heat is turned up too high. You have this great metaphor in the book for heat or coolness in a relationship. So you you break the metaphor down into three parts. It's if I'm remembering correctly, it's fuel, heat, and oxygen. And you know, I think that it can be really a challenge to to stop and do that perspective taking to think about like one of the things you mentioned when you were answering that question about clarity. I think was you know recognizing what brought you and your partner 
to each other, like about your history, you know, to think about like, what has my partner gone through in his life before me that might make him an imperfect human who comes to this relationship, but to be able to engage in that perspective taking at a time that I'm feeling angry or sad or hurt it is really a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, is a big part of this. But why don't we go ahead and break down that metaphor a little bit? Because that was really helpful to me and you really weave it throughout the entire book. So can you walk us through this a little bit and, and how can couples identify if they're too hot or too cold? And what are some ways maybe they can turn that flame up or down? So I use the term flammability because I think it's sort of it can be quite obvious when you sit in the room with a couple or or in my case now obviously over Zoom as well that some of them are more flammable than others there's almost like there's more combustion happening that might be some couples are a bit hotter they're generally more likely to have an argument they're the kind of couples who would slam doors and shout and storm out of the room but they might also then bring heat uh in terms of their makeup they might have makeup sex they might have sort of passionate you know uh, reconciliation there might just be a lot of everything so they bring a lot of heat they're they're very hot couples and now obviously when we think about that metaphor of fire we don't want the fire to be so hot i think there's like the flame is so big that it sort of burns your house down. We want that to be sustainable. We want it to be at a point where you can actually engage with the fire. If you're too close to it, you're just going to get burnt. So the cooler couple might then think that, oh, well, that's the polar opposite. That's that's good. We don't want it to be stormy drama. We don't want it to be just uh, constant arguments. So a cooler couple must then be to be preferable, right? And it's really not because a very cool couple can be someone where you don't see any issues day to day. They're not fighting per se. They're not having disagreements, but they also feel more like flatmates sharing the same address. They're sort of just ticking along, but it might have been that there's no intimacy anymore or there's no fun, there's no joy. They can't like make each other laugh. They've just gone a bit flat. So that's when the fire is dying out. So we want to just breathe some life into that fire so it gets to the point where you get glowing embers. Now, this gets a bit complicated, and I sat with that metaphor for a long time in the book, and it may work for you, may not work for you. So if we're going to be more concrete about it, it's essentially if you're fighting every day, all the time, more than you make up, then that's going to be really exhausting. If you're never having any arguments, that might mean that one of you or both of you are people pleasing or not making your voice heard or not expressing what you actually need or folding in disagreements just to go with, along with what your partner wants. So actually, you're not making compromises, you're hitting more into sacrifices. So you're giving up what you want, because that will keep your partner happy. So there won't be any, uh, is any disagreements. So we think of that almost like a range from very hot to very cold. So it doesn't sound great to describe your ideal relationship as, as lukewarm. And that's not really what I mean. I think of it more <laughs> as just right, just right temperature. Yeah. You know, when you see the glowing embers, that's where you can put in a couple of marshmallows. That's where you can sit there and it gives you a cozy glow. That's what we want. And that means you can, it's sustainable day to day because the drama will burn you up very quickly and the coolness will mean that you just drift apart. And you're like, what's the point of this anyway? I forgot why we even got together. Mm-hmm. Do you think there are ways that couples can bring themselves to that cozy, glowing ember place? Or if they're really hot or really cold, do you think that's a sign, you know, that maybe is when couples therapy is is needed? Well, often couples come to me when they have need for intervention. Often they're, they've they said sort of they're, they're thinking about the D word, you know, divorce or separation, mm-hmm. and they feel on the brink of breaking up. Uh, so statistics show us that people take on average six years before they seek help from first starting to have problems in the relationship. So obviously I would wish to catch people much earlier than that and teach them relationship skills. That's partly why I wrote this book, so we can get into prevention and not just intervention, much yeah. like you would you know, you would go to the gym to build a healthy, strong, fit body, right? Hopefully having longevity in your in your life, you know, being fit and well, rather than waiting around, sitting around and never doing anything to move your body. And then you have to go and see a physiotherapist because you have aches and pains and your back is doing your head in. Actually, that's kind of, I don't want to just be the physiotherapist anymore. I want to be someone who is like your your personal training coach for, for your relationship. And that's yeah. the thing that people can do that if you apply exercises early on training your minds to be more compassionate with yourselves and each other that means that you can actually take the heat out of some of these things you can learn to soothe your threat system the part of your brain that is looking out for danger looking out for a threat and wanting to keep you safe 
So back to that fire metaphor, I guess when we think about the fuel you might bring to the fire, some of us have, through no fault of our own, been through a lot of difficult life experiences. It might be that you're more likely to look out for danger than others. So you might meet a very trusting, loving partner who's come from a background where they were treated really well, they were nurtured by their parents, they were supported by their teachers, and you yourself come from a background where you were frequently criticized or you were bullied in school or you had a few partners cheat on you. So you kind of come into this relationship with maybe a bit of anxiety about being hurt, fear of being abandoned, then actually coming at this from very different points. So then it might be very hard for you to feel at ease and safe and soothed by your partner saying things like, I love you and, you know, I'm not going anywhere. You might be like, well, just you wait. You know, there's going to be an opportunity for you to leave and I'm just going to get there before you. So you might do sort of certain things like engage in certain safety seeking behaviors to make sure that you are safe. If you're able to soothe that capacity, to soothe that tendency to be looking out for danger and threat, uh, with being compassionate with yourself, saying to yourself, well, no wonder that I'm on the lookout for infidelity, for instance, because I was cheated on in my previous relationship. I was really hurt and there was an awful time. No wonder I'm on the lookout. But what's going to be helpful rather than harmful for me to do right now? Helpful might be having a conversation with my partner about this, sharing my fears, talking about my previous experience. The harmful thing might be, you know, going through their entire Facebook and, uh, you know, hacking into emails. And that is driven by that intrusive thought. What if they're going to do it to me? What if I'm going to experience this thing again? So you bring in that fuel with you to the fire. That means that you're feeding the flames. So when we realize that, that okay, well, that's not my fault. First off, a, a big part of realizing that you can start to be compassionate with yourself is saying it was not my fault but it's yeah. my responsibility to do something about it. So saying it's not my fault is not getting rid of uh, accountability. Right. I think this is one of the most powerful tidbits, you know, of all the things we learn in psychology. I think this is one of the things that has really stuck with me most that I think did come originally from Paul Gilbert, this idea yeah. that we all arrive where we are with our different brands of suffering for myriad reasons, you know, evolution, the way we were raised, some of the examples you gave, and none of that is our fault. And it is our responsibility. We're the only ones who can start to make different choices to be able to thrive and have the best relationships that we can have and, and in other areas of our lives. It's really incredibly powerful. Mm. Yeah. And that's where the courage comes in. I suppose, is not yeah. to take that action, right. to assume the responsibility, to hold yourself accountable without bringing self-criticism, shame, yeah. and blame to it. Yeah. Right. Which can sometimes mean, you know, ha like if you're not doing the thing that feels safe, like I'm going to dump you before you dump me or some of these other sabotaging examples, you know, it means needing to be able to interact with some pain to do things differently. And that certainly does take a lot of courage and 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 where self compassion can be so powerful. So why don't we actually talk about that? Because we keep re re we're referring mm. to compassion, um, and we of course we've talked about compassion a lot on the podcast and other domains, but never really in the domain of relationships. And so you know your book, your work are really based on establishing this lasting connection. I love that title, by the way, um, you. through compassion. And you you talk about how this flows in three directions from self to partner, from partner to self, and then from self to self, the self-compassion. And so why, like, can you describe, maybe it seems really obvious, but like, why is compassion and this flow of compassion in these three different ways so critical to specifically building a lasting loving relationship and, and connection? I think it's because people are so quick to assume that the first flow of compassion is what love is, that, you know, you're being kind to your partner, you're caring for them, that's flowing out from you to your partner. Yeah. But in my work with especially high striving perfectionists, people who are very busy, who get caught up in overworking and, and burnout, we see a lot of blocks in these different flows of compassion. And it's not so often that it's from yourself to other people or, you know, including your partner, but it's often blocks in the flow of accepting compassion flowing in. And now that sounds quite fancy. So let's think of an example. Say that you are 
you know, you're sat at home, you've had a really rotten day and your partner pops their head in and says, do you want a cup of tea? And you go, I'm fine, thank you. Or no, I'll get one myself. That's a really easy example to see how you're actually blocking that kindness flowing in. You're not accepting that. So I think about how that second flow of compassion prevents you from getting your needs met. And that can lead to you then feeling really resentful with your partner without even noticing that you're actually doing a bit of blocking. And it might be that you struggle to ask for help, struggle to ask for support. And that's to me, as I write in the book, is kind of the highest level of that compassion flowing in. So we've we've touched upon the the third flow already, self-compassion, but I wanted to say a bit more about the second flow. And I think that's really crucial because when you're with someone, you have to be really vulnerable to admit that you are needing something. You have to be really raw and really sort of almost like take some skin off to say, look, I'm struggling with this and I need you. I need this, the support with this. And plucking up the courage again to ask for help like that can be really difficult, for, especially for people who have a fear of failure, fear of being judged, fear of being criticized, or their own inner critical voice says, you're not allowed to do that because you don't deserve it. So we can be really blocked in receiving or asking for compassion to flow in. This was really powerful for me to read. And, you know, I've read a lot about self-compassion. And of course, there are many barriers and and misconceptions about what self-compassion needs. And I realized that I've given a lot less thought to this flow of compassion from others to self. And it, it especially hit me this week. I had surgery last week and I've needed a lot of help. I can't drive. And I'm normally the one that does pick up and drop off for my kids. Um, you know, my my husband and I practice Eve Rodsky's Fair Play System. I've had her on as a guest a few times. And so we have our cards and I have my duties and he has his duties. And, you know, we're in charge of the conception and planning and execution of those things. And I've had to let him take over many of my cards. And I think if I had just been reading the book and understanding it at an intellectual level, you know, I would have been like, oh, yeah, that's hard for some people. And it wasn't until I was really put in this Mm -hmm. position where I had to accept compassion from him that I really realized like, whoa, this is hard. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) what? Why is this so incredibly hard? And I, I think it's it's a number of the things you've described. And for me, it, there is a feeling of vulnerability. It's almost like a feeling of weakness. You know, like I should be able to function fully and do these things. It's also coming from a historical place, like my own learning history around mm-hmm. being um, let down or disappointed when I've mm. counted on, you know, kind of powerful others when I was a child, you know, some of my caregivers in the past and being let down and disappointed and really learning, you know what, you just have to count on yourself. And as long as you don't ask other people, you can never be disappointed. And there were just, you know, I realized there were so many factors that were contributing to this. And that's at a time where I almost have no choice, right? Like mm. I, I couldn't drive if I wanted to. And so it really made me think, gosh, how often is this happening in much smaller ways where it totally just flies under the radar? Mm, it does. And, and as you're speaking, there's so many things that, that comes to mind for me, everything from maternal gatekeeping to the, the super mom myth, you know, the, yeah. the, the narrative we have for, for women to be always capable and that, you know, need to be strong and independent women. And that can be really difficult to surrender into than interdependence, you know, actually have having independence, but also daring to depend on and rely on another person, you know, a significant other that you're sharing your life with. And, and what you're describing there is that when your fears are showing up, you know, actually, I have fear of letting this in maybe you know, when you have no choice, you have to face those fears. And that's often mm-hmm. when we come kind of closer, close up to our inner work is that when choice gets taken away from us, I mean, we can't engage in our usual safety seeking behaviors right. anymore. And I think we are reinforced for doing all the things and being independent and not asking for help. And even in, in this particular example, I actually did the dishes yesterday and my husband got a little miffed at me. He's like, you're not supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm like, it's been over a week. I can do some things. And so, you know, I there is no reinforcement for me right now 
around being strong and doing the things. Like he is really getting after me about like, just rest, like just go recover. And, and even then it's difficult. So when you think about kind of normal, quote unquote, normal, you know, kind of Western ish cultural contexts, you know, there's a lot of reinforcement and reward for not allowing that compassion to flow in from Mm -hmm. others. So it really does seem like it could be a significant barrier, but also one that, gosh, with a little bit of awareness, you know, that first step of compassion is mindfulness of your own suffering or the suffering of others. So that awareness first and foremost, and then a willingness to, to, to do this differently. And I'm, I'm curious, is there, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but is there like an exercise or is there something that we could even do for listeners to, to be able to practice this or to access this ability to allow compassion hmm. to flow in from others? Interesting. I guess I'm because I would always start with mindfulness exercises, but if it's more about sort of allowing it in, I guess that we can think about sort of like a so what exercise or a then what. So for instance, if you if you picture yourself receiving this help. So what? What would that look like? What would you look like? Yeah, we could do we could do one of those where you picture and visualize a little bit around the facial expressions and the posture that you would have as you're receiving the help. It's almost like you're embodying that that ability to receive it. Yeah, we could do that. Let's do it. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. Okay. So to obviously just to caveat anything that you do that's an exercise, it might bring up stuff for you. And this exercise would be something that I would be doing with couples or individuals way further down the line. We would have practiced sort of mindfulness first, learning to direct your spotlight of attention to things that are going on within you, inside your body. So just caveating that, that if this gives you any discomfort or you don't like it, then just stop and uh, just listen to the rest of the episode afterwards. But what we can try to do if you are okay to listen and just having your eyes closed. So I know Jill and I are going to close our eyes as well, not that you can see us. But I wonder if you can just take a deep breath, a really deep breath in through your nose. And then slowly, slowly releasing that breath out through your mouth, almost like a gentle sigh. And as you're doing so, see if you can have a little gentle smile on your face, almost like a half smile, just turning the corners of your mouth upwards. And as you keep breathing like this, sort of slow deep breaths in, 
And then when you're slowly exhaling, drop your shoulders down, release any tension in the body, wiggle around a bit. Every single time you breathe in, I want you to breathe in compassion. Breathe out people pleasing. And letting the shoulders drop, sitting a little bit more upright, as if you're embodying a posture of someone who is able to receive and accept help and kindness from others. Just thinking about that for a, for a moment. When you keep breathing calmly, just think, what does a person who can do that look like? Maybe they're standing tall. Maybe they got their shin up. Maybe they've got kind of a, a calm composure, gentle smile. What kind of tone of voice would they have when they would say, thank you, I would love that. So just see if we can imagine for a moment, using the power of visualization, that someone that you love dearly, perhaps if you're in a relationship, you imagine your partner doing something really kind for you. And let's just imagine yourself sitting there in this upright position, shoulders down, gentle smile, with this warm voice tone and then expect accepting sorry let's do that again and then accepting their kind offer to support you rather than batting it off just going breathing in compassion when I'm breathing out people pleasing thank you I'd love that that's very kind of you so just take one moment before we bring that kind of exercise so close just sitting there quietly for yourself seeing yourself accepting the help from your partner and then saying in your mind's eye, thank you, I'd love that, that's really kind. And just notice how that feels in your body when you're seeing them do kind things, really pay attention to their facial expression, to their posture, to their tone of voice. How are they supporting you? Are they leaning in, giving you a cuddle, offering you something concrete and practical, giving you a back rub? What are they doing for you? And just really sit and savor with that feeling of being looked after, being tended to, being nurtured. And if this brings up fear for you, this brings up sadness or envy or any of these strong negative emotions that we all have that are very human and normal, don't be afraid. It might just be some echoes from your past of times when you were made to feel that you don't deserve those things. It's time to let go of that. It's time to move forwards and accept the compassion flowing in. So just bringing that very brief exercise to a close, gently open your eyes again and know that I did that most imperfectly, threw in some extra stuff and I would normally do that very, very slowly and over a sort of 10, 15 minutes. So if anyone felt that that brought stuff up for you, then feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Obviously, Jill will put my contact details on there and we can have a chat about compassion if this was really difficult. So just it's nice to have a feel for what it can feel like. Well, thank you so much for doing that. I love that. And what it what it brought up for me is when I just intellectually think about, you know, my husband, for example, offering, would you like a cup of tea? I have this instant sort of resistance, right? This discomfort around allowing that compassion to flow in. But when I did this exercise and what I was picturing was something that actually happened right before we got on Zoom together is he actually handed me a hot steaming cup of coffee. And when I was just picturing that happening and me accepting it, I felt really open and allowing and less resistant. And so I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's almost like if I'm thinking about it in advance, it feels harder to allow. But if I'm just allowing the experience to unfold in the present Mm -hmm. moment, it's actually not as difficult. Does that make sense? It's Mm, like the prediction and the outcome don't match, which is something we talk about a lot in both CBT and ACT is like getting out of your mind 
right? Mm-hmm. Your assumptions, your predictions, and into your experience and that this is something that we really need to do. And I think this exercise kind of opens up that possibility, makes it a little bit more, I, I can visualize it more and it makes it a little mm. bit less less t- intimidating maybe. Yeah. And I hope that anyone who's listening felt the same way, that it sort of gave you an insight into how it could feel because then we're much more able to step into appreciation and gratitude towards our partner when we visualize and we just really savor and sit with the small act of kindness that they did for you. So I would encourage anyone who feels that they're hitting upon a block or a resistance there, that sort of that's very common. We call that fears, blocks and, and resistances uh, in compassion focused therapy. And there's even research done on that. So there's even scales to measure your fears of compassion. So that's how common it is. So you're not alone in any way. So I visualize it and imagine that whenever I feel that my inner critic is trying to block me receiving that support coming in, I kind of imagine that like you do an act as well, that the thoughts and the feelings are kind of along for the ride that they're coming on the journey with you. So my inner critic is right there when I'm reaching out to take that cup of tea and bring it to my mouth. The critic is still right next to me. But the nice thing about compassion focused therapy and what I write in the book that you can create an inner team of allies of support. Mm. So you yes, you might have almost like the devil on one shoulder and then the angel on the other, but it's more maybe appropriate to think of like an inner boardroom. Like you've got just an inner committee of people and you can choose who goes on that committee. So I know that when I struggle, when I don't want to do something, when I'm resisting help, I know it's not my fault. This is where the first part of compassion comes in. It's noticing, acknowledging that this is not my fault. No wonder that I would struggle with this. I'm used to being independent and I've you know, been praised a lot in my life for doing well. And when I'm not doing or performing, my inner critic goes, Mm, you know, maybe you're failing here. So then actually noticing that there's another part in me which I can cultivate on purpose, which I can practice and grow on purpose, which is my compassion itself. And I can mm-hmm. step into that or kind of embody that that version of me that says, yes, please, thank you, that's very kind. And that, you know, we do that with a lot of sort of almost like acting it out. Um, there's a researcher on how when you do this fully with your body, uh, standing as if you were, a compassionate version of yourself walking as if you are talking as if you are that means you're acting as if and you know the term will fake it till, until you make it kind of describes it but it's not quite that you're trying to fake it you're just trying to practice it you're trying to embody it to right. make it your new reality and you know what happens under the hood with that is that you're rewiring your neural pathways and I, that's yeah. the bit i find so fascinating about this work with couples and compassion but, but for anyone is that the more you keep acting as if you are worth it as, as if you are deserving of kindness flowing in the more you're sending messages to those old rules those old narratives and stories that maybe that was true once maybe i mm. believed that once but now that's just a chapter in the book you know that i carry mm. with me And it's just Mm -hmm. that story that shows up. I don't have to act as if it's true. I can accept the cup of tea and go, thank you, that's very kind of you. Even though I want to say, oh, you shouldn't have that stuff Mm -hmm. that shows up. It's just stuff, right? I'm sure you have a bit of stuff as well. Yes, of course. I mean, all humans have their stuff. And, And I think, you know, the very first step to any of this, and I think what the exercise kind of like forces to happen as a way to practice is, is we have to slow down. And, you know, so much of this happens on autopilot. You're talking Mm -hmm. about a lifetime of programming, you know, a lifetime of stuff. And we react on autopilot without thinking really, right? It's so automatic. And that the first step to being able to practice any of these new ways of being or thinking or acting as if is to really be able to slow down to notice that mindfulness component. Again, that's the first component of compassion. I think, you know, people think of mindfulness as like doing exercises and, you know, of course it's paying attention on purpose, but I think in the context of compassion, it's really that awareness of what you're thinking and feeling and how that's influencing your behavior. Mm. And in, and in what ways is that really not workable to building a lasting connection? And, you know, just that piece alone can be really mm. a powerful first step toward making some of these changes. Absolutely. And the literature is, is very solid on that, that actually couples yeah. who practice mindfulness have, can have a greater marital satisfaction, greater 
pleasure in the bedroom. There's a lot of things that are sort of associated with that because we're coming right back to what you said in the beginning, the perspective taking. You know, you're able to tap into empathy. You're able to put yourself in your partner's shoes when you are being mindfully aware of their their circumstances. It's almost like you can direct that spotlight of attention from your own stuff out onto them and then back again. It's like a dance of like, what's mattering most now? I need to pay attention to you. I need to pay attention to me. I need to pay attention to you. I need to pay attention to me. And that's that's what happens when we're listening. And a lot yeah. of couples, it's so basic and it's so hard to do in reality when we are busy and bombarded with stimulus. But a lot of couples don't listen. They're just they're just yeah. waiting for the moment where they can find a slot to say their next thing that they're going to say instead of truly listening. And, you know, my husband always makes me laugh because he, he's, he's in sort of high level sales. And he would always say, but Michaela, you know that we have two ears and one mouth because that's the sales <laughs> thing. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. I um, love that. Yeah, I know. He's also obviously read and edited my book. So I love it when he sort of, when I, when we get caught up in a, an argument I, and I might say like in the heat of the moment, have you even read my book? And he would go, have you? <laughs> and it's just, ah! then we just start to laugh and it's just like yeah yeah oh being silly. my gosh I love that well let's let's talk a little bit more about that because I imagine you know people listening who if they're experiencing conflict in their relationship this has to be the hardest place to come from if I'm you know, angry, you, you talk about the angry, anxious, sad, critical self, you know, when we're having a lot of hot, difficult emotions, if we're feeling resentful, et cetera, that has to be the hardest place mm. to access compassion for our partner. And I imagine even some people, you know, this kind of last segment about allowing compassion to flow in may be saying, well, my partner never does anything nice for me. I would allow the compassion to flow in if they would just give it to me. So so for, for folks who are kind of in that high conflict space that you want to get to a place of being able to express compassion toward their partner, as well as allowing it to come in or maybe even asking for it, that may be something they need to ask for. You know, what? what's the starting point there? How do people move to that place? It's a really tricky one because I feel like it's almost like two questions and one there. There's, mm. One is around sort of the, the different aspects of us where you can think about, you know, your multiple selves. So in the book, I go through some examples, but, you know, some researchers have shown that we have like 122 different selves. So when you say my true self, you know, well, what is that? So when you are showing up in an anxious way with your partner, is that your true self? Or when you're being really critical of something they've done, is that your true self? No, it's actually many different versions of you that you can step into. And your compassionate self is just one of those versions. So we can practice that. We can cultivate that on, on purpose. But I want to bring it back to sort of thinking about high conflict and that when people are saying this to me, that I, I can't imagine anything that my partner ever does for me that's kind. So we then have to be curious rather than furious. Is there a case here in your dynamic that you have said no thank you without realizing so many times that they've stopped offering? Mm. Is there a chance that you're with someone who is actually actually unkind? That does happen. You know, we can't squeeze blood out of a stone. And I'm never married to the result, no pun intended. I'm I'm kind of committed to the journey with people. And sometimes the most compassionate thing to do when I work with people in couples therapy is to end that relationship that's become toxic and you're actually not getting any of your needs met and changing the dynamic or even just practicing a bit of mindfulness is not going to do that for you. It's going to be that you become mindfully aware that you've maybe selected a partner who is feeding these beliefs because they're acting in a, in a, in a way that you don't deserve. So hmm. sometimes my, my work is about having people to uncouple or to, to break up. Yeah. Uh, but also being curious about whether you got caught up in a very, very common dynamic between couples, which is called withdraw and demand. So within behavioral couples therapy, that's that's something we kind of look at how it's almost like a seesaw, if you may, that where one partner is then kind of asking for something and does it in such a way that the other person feels really threatened and they start to sort of check out, basically, they start to withdraw. We see that more so in sort of cis hetero couples uh, where the woman might have better tolerance for emotional conflict. They can hold more emotions before they get overwhelmed in their threat system. Whereas men are less socialized to practice expressing emotion. So it's not about like men are from uh, Mars and women are from Venus. It's not about that. That's quite outdated mm -hmm. stuff. It's much more about how we don't socialize in this and women are 
rewarded and praised for navigating conflict from being young girls when we have drama drama in sort of our uh, friendship circles whereas men get really overwhelmed by the same level of argument if you measure the blood cortisol in in men and women men have a higher spike so they might then withdraw because they feel like oh my god i can't handle this so they start to numb or they um you know they kind of start to freeze and they say nothing and then in that sort of same hetero couple the woman might say come on say something why aren't you saying anything and then he uh and he might then literally get up and leave the room so we can kind of see a physical withdrawal. So we have to think about that in conflict situation. Have you got into a, a withdrawal and demand pattern that we need to unpick before we can start to bring higher levels of positive interactions? We first me- must unpick the negative interactions first. So increasing the positives is important, you know, going on date nights and having more intimacy, having fun. But we first need to decrease the negatives. Otherwise, it's going to fall really, really flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And you talk about some of the reasons that couples disconnect. And some of these were really surprising to me because they're really problems of modern making. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about what some of those are, because I think the good news is when I read that, I thought, oh, those are actually like somewhat easy fixes. Mm. You know what? Sometimes it gets me actually quite scared when I think about how couples are living. And as a psychologist, I'm sure you feel that way as well. It's like you get this rare insight into people's lives. You get to hear the deepest, darkest secrets. So I feel like I've got this privilege of getting to see how people are living and the problematic kind of dynamics that they get into. And one of those things is definitely busyness. You know, the, mm-hmm. there might be because we run a clinic that's been, you know, based in London, UK. Now I work uh, solely online, so I work with couples everywhere. But it tends to be high striving people who are corporates or, you know, professionals. And there is so much busyness, partly because of how we have this pressure to achieve, pressure to perform, pressure to always be available, always be on. That means checking your emails at 10 o'clock at night when actually previously, Back in the 90s, that wouldn't be possible. You would just go to bed and read a book. So you could still avoid your partner if you wanted. But (laughs) it's not as as rewarding. Whereas these things I see today, there's such a dopamine hit. You know, the reward system is getting such a a kick when you're picking out your phone and you're just going to scroll through something or you're chatting on WhatsApp to a friend who isn't there. So you're connecting with someone who isn't there and disconnecting with someone who is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so much of it was, you know, that technology based essentially. And, and I shouldn't say these are easy fixes. Of course, they're not easy fixes, but that there, there are like concrete ways you can intervene if you make some choices about putting down your phone. And of course, yeah. it's difficult to just, just don't be so busy. Just say no. But I do think there is something to be said for learning how to say no, you know, to be much more choosy about what we say yes and no to. And in a minute, I want to ask you about values because I think it's very related to that. But when the pandemic started, my husband and I, just like everybody, we both started working from home. And I've noticed it has really created this interesting context for us to really reconnect because our kids are at school, you know, we're still working, but there are little breaks throughout the day and we choose to use those breaks. You know, I go up to his office and sit there for a few minutes and chit chat and then he comes down to my office and there are days where I've had to sort of sternly say, listen, today's a writing day, no interruptions, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? But it's it has really like allowed us to reconnect in ways that I I don't think that I would have predicted until it happened. And I feel so grateful for that. And part of it is just having that face to face time together away from technology, you know, letting go of some of the busy, like even when there's that urgency of I got to do this, I got to respond to this email that I stop and say like, but do I like, Mm -hmm. can I take five minutes to turn around and just have a conversation? Is something on Um, fire? Probably not. Exactly. Right. Like it may feel urgent, but that's just an internal experience. That's not real. Yeah. And I think that's that experience you're describing is so common. I've actually had quite a variety of of experiences where people have gone a bit of both. You know, when I've been asked, I do a lot of media features and been asked sort of for for the press to talk about couples in the pandemic. And they've all wanted to know, like, has this made things better or worse? And I'm going to, I always give sort of the classic psychologist answer of it depends, you know, it depends. I love that one. I'm sure you say that to your clients as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
It's that it depends on the function it holds for you. So some couples where there's been major cracks beforehand, that will just be cracked wide open when you're yeah. piling on top of each other and then throwing your kids and there's no childcare and you know we all have fear of our loved ones dying, etc. So the pandemic has brought out the best and the worst in some ways. So when couples have sort of felt we inherently still like each other, we still are good friends, but we just don't spend enough time together. And that mere exposure effect comes into play that you're spending time together and you're enjoying it because you're suddenly sharing the story of each other's day. You might hear yeah. snippets of their day. They might be like, oh, I just got off the phone call with this person. Oh, it was such a tricky one, blah, blah. And then you might hear things that they would have previously just done with their coworkers and you get to be more involved in their day. Oh, I hadn't really thought about that aspect of it. That's so true because, you know, at 530, when we're both coming home from our offices, it's, how was your day? Fine, fine. You know, there's not a lot of Mm -hmm. sharing what happened at 10 o'clock this morning, but when we're together and it's happening in real time, we are the person that we're talking to about it. So that's that I hadn't thought about it that way. That's really interesting. So that's that's a kind of sharing, that's a kind of living together, sharing a life together that's very important. And this is why it's important, important to have that communication at the end of the day or at the end of the week if you need to kind of catch up if you've had very busy lives. What's happening for you at the moment? What are your fears at the moment? What's going on for you? What are you what are you hoping for? What's on your bucket list? Like all of these sort of uh ways of navigating your your um your interests, your wishes, your fears, everything that's important about your partner that you think you know because you've been together so long you think I know them inside out but luckily we grow and develop you know thank goodness for that because otherwise you think you get together with someone in your 20s and then you know here you are 20 years later and you kind of think oh they're not grown at all of course they've evolved so if we have to kind of keep with that evolution and that also means I mean this is a fun fact for anyone listening that we can also find a, a real sort of powerful attraction to hearing a partner perform at their best, being their best mm. self at work. And we never really, unless you work together, get to see that aspect of our partner when there's sort of like, you know, my husband's, you know, is delivering a, a pitch, you know, to a multi-billionaire somewhere. And I'm just like in awe of how he is composing himself. Right. And, you know, those kind of things that you would never really hear. The downside of that is you also hear them like being silly with their coworkers, but, and you see how many coffee mugs they leave around their office. But <laughs> everything I think has just been highs and lows. Of course, there's lots of couples that have really struggled because of the pandemic. And often that has been maybe coming to your question around values because there's been more crystallized that, the values aren't shared. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a perfect segue is, you know, you talk about how important it is to, you know, we, we, on the podcast, we talk a lot about kind of individual values, but in the book, you talk about shared values that couples have together. And I'm wondering how can couples identify their relationship values together, not just what matters to me as a human, but what matters to us as a, as a dyad? Mm. Well, it's, I think it's sort of important to start from the individual values and there might be then thinking, oh yeah, I resonate with that. That's important to me too. Well, no, that isn't important to me because, and then you might then get to another value. And it's really important to not copy or mimic the other person's values you don't have to match everything that's not about you know i need to be compatible on every value it's it's compassion that you can bring to that to actually having compassion for your incompatibilities that you don't have to be evenly matched in everything but can you be compassionate about how your partner has a value around adventure perhaps and wants to take a you know an annual skiing trip or just not really fun with their best mate and you're like oh that sounds dreadful are you more of a homebody and you feel like security and safety is more important to you, for instance. Can you bring compassion to that and think that we are different, but I respect you and you respect me and I allow you the freedom to pursue that value so that you'll be fulfilled in your life? So that's individual values. Yeah, and it almost seems related to that committed caring and the clarity. And, you know, another C word comes to me, which is curiosity is, Mm -hmm. you know, have you ever even sat down and talked to your partner about your values and their values and where those things align and where they don't? And I think it can be so informative for the decisions that you make for your family, for your for your life Mm -hmm. that just starts with something that could be a really connecting conversation. Absolutely. And it, everything can follow from that. If you are aware of your partner's maybe top three, top five values, even if they're different to yours, it's a lot easier to do everything 
from gifting them the nef- next birthday present to understanding when they need a bit of space. You know, you need to do mm. this thing because you feel unfulfilled if you don't get to do this thing. What do you need to thrive? And what do I need to thrive? And how do we compromise and balance that back and forth so that it feels right. equal and fair? Right. Well, I'm going to take that as a homework assignment because even as an ACT therapist myself, I will admit I have never sat down and had that conversation with my husband. I think I've just sort of assumed like we just kind of know that about each other. We get each other. But what a cool conversation that could be over a beer or a glass of wine yeah. while we're just kind of hanging out this weekend. So, yeah. well, Michaela, we're at about at the end of our time. Thank you so much for being here. This was such an interesting conversation. Again, the book is The Lasting Connection. It's really powerful stuff. And like I said at the beginning, I think offers a really unique perspective that can be helpful to so many people. And, and whether you're currently coupled or just have a desire to be coupled at some point, you know, I think that this is really interesting and powerful stuff. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed how in-depth and uh, vulnerable we've kind of got. Yes, me too. And thank you for for uh, bearing with me with that exercise for, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Humoring me and, and <laughs> responding right on the spot with that exercise. I hope people find that helpful. So if people want to learn more about you and the work you do, where can they find you? So they can go to my company website, thethomasconnection.co.uk. And that's where you can read more about my podcast, Pause, Purpose, Play, where you can listen to episodes, not just about couples, but individuals as well. And I have my online course, The Compassionate Couple, which you can also look at on the website. And you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, all of these places under The Thomas Connection. Excellent. Well, I love that course option. That means for people who aren't readers, they can get the same good, juicy information, but in a different format. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with us on social media and purchase swag from our merch store by going to our website at offtheclockpsych.com slash merch. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, our dissemination coordinator, Katie Rothfelder, and our editorial coordinator, Melissa Miller. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.